psychic learn uh, with like a brief kind of overview of what some of the techniques in machine learning, not deep learning, but just the smaller subset of machine learning, the more general machine learning. So, you know, an introduction to machine learning, a, a general understanding of how to navigate Psychic Learn, because it's got a great amount of tutorials, it's got a, a good amount of examples, it's got a good amount of, okay, how do I get this to work? And a good help, a lot of people have uh, on it. And then we won't get into application to genomics right now, but over the two sessions, that's what I want to do, get into the applications of genomics. And so some of this you can see in this handbook, there's a caveat that this is a real old handbook. So some of this, the code does not work uh, because they've changed the libraries, but it's, a, it, I mean, it's still decent. Uh, it's got stuff we talked about pandas and it's free. Uh, and uh, you can buy it, but also you can get most of it here. And then some stuff like more in depth. And in general, it's the same. It's just maybe a library has, has been changed, which is different. Okay. So what is machine learning? It's, it's a subset of artificial learning. It's been around for a while, like well before I was born. Uh, it's just starting to get more powerful because of the increasing data size and the increase in computational power too. Uh, and there's three kind of main ones, but we, we're really only going to touch on an, unsupervised learning and supervised learning. And I'm going to be real, if you've done anything with bioinformatics, you probably use these uh, just in more like a simple kind of way. So like UMAPs, PCAs, linear regressions, you, you, you've done classification, supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, so the psychic learn is like the holy grail of machine learning for Python. It is got pretty much everything in one. It's nicely organized too, and it's well maintained. So it's classifications, regressions, clustering, dimensional reduction, model selection, pre-processing. You can go into each one of these with great uh, examples and, and detailed like a user guide uh, where Oh, we're talking about supervised learning. It goes into each one individually, and it's got a buttload. Uh, it even has a small kind of neural network. I don't recommend doing neural network with this, but if you wanted to like dip your toes into it, this this is the place to go. This is where everybody's using uh, for like basic things like uh, random forest, uh, gradient tree boosting, stuff like that. Uh, you don't need to make them your own unless you're doing a neural network. So, you know, user guides, examples, all that jazz. So with that, we're going to start getting to the code. And then I just made this function here where I'm using function tool and this LI coach. This is the way to do memorize and R. So, it runs it once if it's a huge amount, and then it mem it puts this information into cush, so in memory, and then you don't have to do it again. Uh, and to do that, instead of having to make like a function when Josh was going over it, you just put this line of code here, right on top of the uh, function, and then it does the exact same thing uh, without any extra information. So. This is the penguins data set we were using last time. And I just made it into a function. So when we are doing machine learning, uh, especially with the psychic learn, you have two kinds of variables, they're matrices. One of them is going to be your features. So, and then the other is your target. So your X is your features, your Y is your target in like a linear model kind of kind of way of thinking. Uh, for these, they expect that the rows are going to be samples and then the columns are going to be features. So if they have a data set of, say, uh, 30 by uh, 300, that means you have 300 features and 30 samples or vice versa. Uh, and the thing is, you can have multiple targets. Uh, so if you have like target and and it, we're not talking about you have one target where you're looking at 
uh, schizophrenic control bipolar and that's all in one encoded you can have like multiple outputs like uh for maybe you have a regression and a classification you want to output some of these have inherent features to do that but in general we're going to be very simplistic but we're going to have one target uh, so it's more like a vector and not a matrix but you can have a matrix size for your targets multiple targets multiple predictions so we're just going to look at the data because you're always supposed to look at it uh, this is just telling uh, telling uh, Jupiter to do inline so you don't have that weird you don't need to assign it to anything and you don't have anything weird uh, coming looks good it looks like you could probably classify it pretty well the pink wins and then here's some random so as an example things we've done in the linear regression we did last time uh, with the random data here we had to insert models the OI, the ordinary least square model uh, and then write our uh, equation linear find the summary and then when we want to extract the information we would from that model we get the parameters we get the r square it's simple enough uh, when we want to do that with psychic learn uh, we input the linear model and from linear models linear regression because that's what we're doing and then we fit it with the intercept and that's doing the same thing as uh define it's like initiating your your uh, model uh, and here i'm cleaning the I'm subsetting, re rearranging it so it's in your matrix, so it's not just a, a vector. So now we have a shape, 50 and one. It's still a shape, but it, it is a shape. And then you fit it. So it's the same thing as you're fitting it here with the fit, uh, except you're fitting it with X and Y, so the features and then target. And, and it's been run same thing and so if i want to get the intercept i want to get the coefficient and then the r square you can just grab them from from the model and it's exactly the same thing so negative 0.9 uh, and these numbers match up exactly the same because they're using the same model ordinary least square now, I, I know what I'm doing here because I know how to get the intercept, the coefficient, which is the, the x that we're doing since we only have one, and the score. But if you're just like, where the, where, what are all these things? What did I just do? You can go to that API and it will tell you, here's an example. Uh, and then if you go into it, how to, what it's expecting, the parameters, so that fit intercept true or false, do we have an intercept in there? The default is true. You wanna normalize it, we're not doing any normalizing, keeping everything here. The in jobs is if you're doing something very large and you wanna use more than one thread. Normally it uses just one thread. Uh, if you do minus one, it uses all the threads in the machine. Now the attributes, the stuff we were getting out of the model, that's the attributes. So the coefficient, that was, uh, for the coefficient of x and it's depending on the number of features we only had one feature so we got one coefficient uh rank i'm not going to go over but the intercept when we fit the intercept we also got that uh, so that's parameters that's attributes but i also got the r square out of that that is a method so the fit you're applying a method the score and prediction are all methods and for the linear model, the score is an R square. And these are somewhat different depending on whether you're doing a classification or a regression. But want to know more about it, you, you're, you put the X, the Y, uh, and if you're doing some type of weight, which we're not, and then it will output that number. And it's doing the same thing as if you were doing an R square, an R, R2 score test, R squared test. So. So for when we're, we're dealing with this, and this is this is the same kind of for every kind of machine learning algorithm that Psychic Learn has, it's the same 
mechanism. You have a model. In that model, you'll have parameters you can tune. And uh, once you've done that, you can fit the model with fit and then either predict on something and extract things from the model. So you can extract the attributes, you can apply stuff to the model, uh, and, and that is the same for everything. Some of the attributes might change, some of the scoring might change, but the fit, prediction, scores, those are pretty much similar no matter what model you're doing, whether it's a linear regression or of some type of uh, scalar vector, some, some like gradient boost. Uh, so any questions on like the psychic learn format is otherwise we're going to go straight into like a test doing a doing one with the penguin data. So we'll start with supervised in general, you know, classification or regression are the big two categories. Uh, and what we want to make sure we do when we're doing this is we don't want to overfit. Uh, so if you have these two kinds of data here, this blue and this red, you want a nice line that's very close to this black, but you don't want it to look like the green where it's overfitting the data because then that means you're going to get a poor prediction on your next set. So one way to avoid this issue is to create a training and a test set. So you're not doing all of your uh, analysis on the same data all pulled together. So you subset your X and your Y into a set that you can train your model in and then a smaller set you can test to, to, about, to see how well, uh, to check, pretty much check to validate that it's not overfitting or underfitting. Uh, so for the ping one, we just need to, uh, we're gonna predict species. So I'm gonna drop the species uh, from X and then and Y, we're, that's our target. We're going to put the species in there. And then uh, what's very important for uh, the inputs for a lot of these models is that it needs to be like numer uh, numerical. So what we do is for categorical data, because the penguin has a bunch of categorical data, we switch that to the coded version. That's one way to recode it. You can also do like hot. Uh, one hot encoding, but for us, it's just simple to just uh, change these categorical data, like the island the penguins are from, sex, and year, into categories and use the coded version for that. So you know, now instead of having the names, we, we have like ones and zeros, and, and it's all a numeric. If, if you don't do this, you're just going to get a bug, and then you're like, oh, what happened? Go back to the data, uh, fix it, you should be good. So there's a nice does, does the error message kind of point you in this direction or you have to like Google around? I don't know. Um, let's see, did I run this? I did. Let's not run this here. And then we're just gonna run this. And then the model and get the error metric. It says could not convert string to flow. Uh, so that pretty much tells you you've got string data and then you just need to, so I would say the error message would be is valuable here. Uh, because we have flow, we have string, it pretty much tells you that it had trouble there. So yes. All right, thanks. Yeah, but I mean, seeing the error is good so we can. Uh, yeah recognize that like oh, okay this is what we need to fix do to fix it type of thing yeah i the this google the google collab street also has a search stack overflow for your error messages i've not used it yet but it will but if you just click it it googles the error for you so if you're that is not something that happens in jupyter notebook uh, it's just this thing with the google collab so if you're you're wanting to like troubleshoot some stuff you, this might be an interesting way to do it if if you've got small data. Okay, so we're, we're going to rerun it. Uh, to do the test and training split, uh, you just import it from model selection, uh, and then you, it's expecting x, y, and then for I'm doing random state so that we can all get the same stuff. 
And then the training size, if the default is 50%, I can tell you right now, you never want to use 50% um, uh, because you just don't have that kind of, uh, you're, you're using a shit ton of data uh, for your, 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 your training instead. And it's better to go 0.25 or three. Uh, and I've just put a list of different uh, classification uh, that they have. This is not all of them, there's more. Uh, I like to use the SOMO methods, but I know a lot of people who do a lot of different other things. And then what I was talking about other, uh, that you can have a, you have to be careful about what you're using for input. So like a logistic regression, that requires binary, uh, but our penguins, there's three categories. So we could not use that model. So the, the biggest, thing that you're going to do when you're doing machine learning is selecting the correct model uh, and understanding what that model does is important a lot of people will run three or four different models uh, you run one model you're you're familiar with to just get it dirty and then once you have that then you run another model to see if you can improve it by using a different kind of uh, uh, approach uh, so for with that said, like a logistic regression, you can convert the data by doing a one versus rest. So you can do a logistic regression if you do these other things with the classification. Uh, so you're going to uh, apply, uh, it's pretty much applying this uh, kind of converter uh, onto your, your uh, data, onto your model. And if you're ever confused, you just kind of Google, go to this search here. And then it's quite easy to find and they have a very detailed expl explanation and the user guide so you can see how it's used. And, you know, this is just converting a binary into a multi-class. So this is normally expects binary and you're saying actually do this, but do one versus rest. So I picked the Gaussian Naev Bayes because it was following the handout. Uh, and this can output multiple classes. So it's very useful for that. And then you fit your model and your training data. And then you want to predict to test how well it is. So you've got your model, you do predict, and obviously predict X to get your Y predictions. And then the next step after you've selected your model, initiated your model, fit your model, uh, is to get the appropriate metric. Uh, for classification, accuracy score is normally good, but you can also do rock curve uh, and then also Confucius matrix. So for classification, it is expecting the true, true data first and then the predicted data. And if you're ever confused, you just look in the API and it's very detailed about what you're supposed to do. Uh, it's very detailed about what you're supposed to do. And this is very good uh, prediction is 96. And I like the Confucius matrix because you can see, virtually see what the predictions are. Uh, almost completely getting this one. I think that's probably uh, Ginto penguins. And it's very accurate. It's very, only a handful of these are miss, uh, are miss, uh, incorrectly assigned, misclassified. Another way to make sure you're not overfitting and what is pretty standard is to use a is to use a cross validation. Normally, what we would do is we would code uh, a developmental set. So you take your training set and you do another split for the training set so that you have three sets you're training a developmental set and a test set. And then you would split the data a bunch of times and then uh, do each one and using the developmental set to test uh, how accurate it is before you get your final set. Uh, the 
a sidekick learn has a built-in function that does cross-validation for you. Uh, so here's a, 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 a K nearest classification, nearest neighbor classification of the same data. It does 76. That's pretty poor classification since we just got uh, a 96. Uh, so what you could do is you can do uh, cross val and you can get the cross validation which will give us that same accuracy store this here you're not separating your you're not separating the data into test and train you're giving the data the model which is this this uh this algorithm and the original data prior to the splitting into test to train because the cross validation is going to make as many folds as you tell it to. And for this, it's five folds. And so we can see that, you know, some of the folds are doing 76, some of them are doing 92. Uh, so if you did the mean, it's probably like an 80 or something, 85% classification out of all of these. I think we could actually do that here. Eighty-four, eighty-five. That's that's close. Uh, another way of doing this is like a more intense version of of, of cross validation, where you're doing leave one out. It literally is exactly what it says. It takes one sample, pulls it out, and then it trains the model on all of them, but that one, and tests it on the one. So it does that for as many samples as you have. There's three hundred and thirty. Uh, three uh, samples in this penguin data after dropping NAs. So if you're looking at maybe a thousand, I would not suggest using leave one out, but for us, this doesn't take too long. Uh, and then it pretty much gets a little bit closer to that 85 that the five cross fold validation we did. So we'd say using this near, nearest neighbor, with the one neighbor, uh, the accuracy is about 85%. Obviously, you probably would want to use a different model, uh, but it's still decent. And it, this is just looking at it more. Uh, it's very, it is very important to use kind of cross validation so that people know that it's not kind of a fluke. Like maybe you got 92 just because of the, how the samples were versus the 76. So cross validation really is a must of some sort. Uh, and then, so that's the basis. That's how you're putting everything together. The next bit, uh, which is training your model. Uh, so what we normally do is you do your first model, you just need to get it to work because that will take some time. Once you get it to work, the next step is to hyper tune. So that means each one of these parameters, they have uh, each one of these, these uh, algorithms have parameters as like random forest, for instance. I wish I want to. Random forest, for instance, it's got a number of estimators, the type of accuracy it does, and then a bunch of things about leaf depth and stuff like that. Uh, Depending on what those parameters will, are depends on how well your your machine learning will do, which is why a common question somebody will ask you is like, did you need to hyper tune to get to this uh, well, like 92? If the answer is yes, then that means it's going to be a bit of work uh, for somebody at, to do the same thing out of the box. Uh, uh, without doing any hyper tuning, we're getting 87, uh, 97. 98% accuracy. So I would say random force is very good on the penguin data, even better than that uh, Gaussian uh, naive base. But say you got something less, you could hyper tune. Sorry, sorry, with, is, is there a way to set like a random seed or something? Because like, I mean, I, yes. get, I get almost the same number you get, but I get it slightly different. Okay. Yeah, random state. We'll do random state 13. And then everybody will get the same thing. Uh, and then we'll just put the random state in here too. 
So the grid search, this grid search is using cross validation. You can do a grid search for that, but cross validation is always good. Because it, and you, what you do is you have this dictionary where you put the parameter and then the things you want to test. So you could have a huge range where you do one through 500 or something, and then a number of estimates where you do the same range. And then you put this and every parameter you want to test into grid search with the algorithm and the parameters and then how many cross cross full validations you want to do it. I tested this it doesn't take too long uh, and you can then fit the data using the grid uh, and this is where it's actually going to run so this is initiating the model as soon as you fit it that's when you're you're uh running the analysis and then it'll be nice output everything you need to know about the estimator what it did uh and then you want to know what the best parameters is it's best parameters at none 100 and these are the default parameters so that's probably why we got such a good score the first time so you can then set your model you don't have to rerun it you set the model which is your estimator with the best parameters so doing the random force classifier with those parameters and then you fit it on the training and then the test and you look at the accuracy and this is pretty much the same thing as when we first did it here because we're using the exact same model Theoretically, if you have some worse data or you're doing something like gradient boost, which has a lot of, it needs to be hypertuned. Random force is nice because it normally doesn't need that much tuning. The default parameters are normally good. Uh, but like something like gradient boost, that requires a good amount of hypertuning to get the best, uh, which is normally why I don't use it. Uh, and you can do cross-validation here too. Uh, and the difference here is we're now using random force. So before we were using that uh, Gaijin, uh, I think uh, we were using the nearest neighbor, but now we're using random force. This takes a minute, but that is one of the other caveats. Random forest is making a hundred trees. So it's doing a hundred decision trees. So it's doing a hundred of these permutations based off of the number of estimators. So it is, going to be much longer than say some of these other uh like elastic net some of the other uh algorithms and then from here we have the validate score but say you want to keep the model you can also do cross validation here uh where you put the model in you put the number of crosses and then it outputs uh the test scores but then also how long it took to do each one of these, which might be useful if you are uh, doing uh, some development. And then since this is five versus the leave one out, it's kind of close, but not the same. Another good thing about random forest and theoretically some of the other models you can get this is feature importance that one of those issues with machine learning is you have a model and then it's a kind of a black box. Uh, with a random forest, it, it keeps all of the features and it does a feature importance. So you can create a data set where you put back in the feature and you can figure out what is the importance for that feature. So for penguins, determining which species, the most important thing the most in fact 50%, 55% of the importance is made up with bill length and flipper length. And uh, sex not so important, which is good. Uh, year and island. I thought island might be a predictor, but apparently there must be multiple penguins in the same island. So that that's pretty much it for like going into depth in some of these classifiers for supervised learning uh any any questions and stuff is this really we're really just putting our fingers in here after maybe your pinky 
wish it around. So I'm gonna move on. Yeah. yeah this, I think this um and this this was great, I think. Uh uh I don't know what, that much about the tidy models. Um mm -hmm. Martha has presented that approach in R, which is a way of trying to combine all these R packages that do machine learning, but providing like a unified uh, framework. Because uh, that's, I guess, one of the challenges with R is that like every package has a different syntax and all of this. Yes, because there's random forests. There's a bunch of different random forests, R packages, but like, man, it's different. It, 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 one, it's different. It's not, you can't just port, like literally with this, I have written scripts where I have changed just the, just the uh, parameter uh, of uh, the model. Like I've replaced like a logistic regression with random forest. And if you don't add anything, just default, you, you need to do literally zero extra work, except for a feature importance. But so it's like, it's, it's super, super nice. Uh, Cause once you've learned how to do one kind of model, you can then uh, use pretty much everything. Uh, with confidence. confidence. And, and it works the same pretty much with the uh, unsupervised stuff. So clustering and dimensional reduction, you can literally just copy and paste your uh, algorithm, uh, whether we want to use uh, principal components analysis, PCA or MDS. Uh, literally all you would do is switch this out or even TSEM or any, any of those models. Uh, so here's an example. I still prefer to use PCA and R, but that, uh, but if you are doing something in, in Python, it's pretty simple. Uh, here, if you don't say how many components, it will do the smaller of sample size or feature. Uh, but we only really need the two components. So normally, uh, two is the default in some of these things. And it's the same, same format thing. You initialize, you fit, and then the only difference is you need to transform. Uh, some things have a fit transform, but if you don't transform the data, uh, you're not going to get uh, the output you want. Uh, here, where we're looking at the uh, transformed data. And here's an example with the TSEM from Manifold Learning. I had to play, I did have to parameter tune this uh, to get it to do some separation. The biggest thing is perplexity is normally 30. So if you're using TSEN, you would want to do a grid search for complexity learning rate, and then initiating it with either random or PCA. I found that this looked better with PCA than random. So let me show you guys with random. It's fast enough that it's not coming from the rerun. It just looks so weird. Uh, and then, so if we want to look at it, perplexity of 30. Say the Ginto, separate bell, and then who, who the fuck knows what the other two uh, species are based off of the data we put in. So I, I would say stick with this, the PCA for this. And then I think, uh, yeah, I played around with random here too. makes no sense. Uh, so yeah, the pictures here, uh, I'm using uh, Seaborn. When we use the clustering, uh, and here I'm using Gaussian mix mixture. Uh, the thing you need to remember is to put in the how many clusters you expect. And I think it's the same for when you're doing like K-means or something in R where you need to put it in. The in components here is how many you expect. Uh, the in components here is how many you want out. It's technically the same. You want three clusters. 
and so I think a simpler way to graph this is when you're it's just to use the uh, MATLAB scatter. And you can see it graphed here. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, when I'm using this uh, Seaborn, we've made a data frame, something like if you were doing ggplots. So you just would need to add the these components in here before you plotted it. And this is just showing you what the clusters are separated. Uh, and you can see that, you know, it really good at the uh, Ginto, but like the other uh, Adelaide and Chinstrap, they separate, they just do not separate in the way we wanted them to separate. Yeah. They do look different, they just. So maybe there's more similarity to them than, than we want to say with the Ginto. So the, the breakout session, it, don't feel like you have, to, it's somewhat intense. Um, you're gonna do, apply a manifold learning a technique onto this uh, toy data, uh, which is just four classes of digits. And then either identify the clusters with a K-means or a mixture, gradient mixture like we did, and then plot it with colors, uh, which is why I went into a little bit more detail on the plotting I did here and which one is easier to do. And then the second one is doing a supervise where you're gonna split the data into training and set and then classify those digits with either the gauge we used or the random forest. So there's code for both of those. Print the accuracy and then also do like a Confucius matrix to, to visualize. And so probably, yeah, let me see about splitting us for the breakout. Page. 